Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Piers Nurian. I'm from Genesis Lab, uh, Delphi University of Technology. I have the honor and pleasure of introducing to you Dr. Marina Constanta, too. I hope I pronounced your name properly. Yeah, yeah it was good. <laughs> uh, Marina is a, is a mathematician by background and the, the lead researcher of the Spatial Modeling Group in Foster and Partners. And she's here uh, today with us for sharing her insights into 3D graphic statics. This is something that I've been very, very curious about lately uh, uh, as to its uh, great potentials for intuitive design, uh, I would say, of structures. And Marina's uh, unique approach to this uh, actually unites a geometric approach, a, uh, a first principle approach based on differential equations, and the third one I already forgot, so we'll hear from you. <laughs> so in my mind, it's a very uh, elegant mathematical approach. Uh, and the, the first idea for this lecture came from um, looking at her uh, dissertation, which is a great, great piece of work, and uh, also another paper about um, novel ways of constructing efficiently and also in, in equilibrium for compression only structures or form active structures. So you will hear all uh, the details from Marina herself and she has agreed to uh, my frequent interruptions during the presentation. I will play the role of a very curious student because that's that's a fact. I'm, I'm, I'm very curious. I want to make sure that I will remember how to how to read more and how to understand her work. So thank you for accepting this invitation, Marina, and we are very pleased to have you here. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you for the uh, invitation, Perus. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so today the presentation is going to be slightly odd. Uh, the first part is going to be focusing on my PhD research, and the second part is going to be focusing more on the work we do uh, at the specialist modeling group um, and specifically relating to additive manufacture and extreme environments such as the extraterrestrial one. Um, and then I will explain how this leads to um, our current research into component-based structures, which could be a very interesting topic to discuss further with uh, Piruz and uh, the audience here. So uh, just a very uh, brief introduction on my background. My, um, my first degree was mathematics uh, with a bit of engineering. Um, but uh, after being quite interested in computational design and computational geometry, um, I ended up doing uh, structural design. Um, so my main interests are sort of in the intersection of those uh, three areas um, and are mainly structural design, form finding, and architectural geometry. Uh, these are the collaborators uh, during my PhD research uh, with whom uh, we developed uh, most of what uh, you'll see in the next slides. So to give you a bit of historical background uh, regarding this uh, PhD research, this started from some inaccessible at the time um, papers from Maxwell, uh, James Clerk Maxwell, who is uh, best known for his work in uh, physics. Um, however, he did also quite a bit of seminal work when it comes to uh, actually structures and structural analysis and geometry. So some people uh, even say that Maxwell was a geometer, not a physicist. Uh, another uh, person that uh, is very important for uh, what we've been looking at was uh, Eri, uh, and specifically his research on the Eri stress function, and then also Poncelet, who was the founder perhaps of projective geometry. And as you can see from the dates, all those people lived around the 19th century. So 19th century was a very, very interesting uh, period in terms of history of science, and specifically uh, in relation to what um, we are. Uh, looking at. Uh, and when I was started to, to, to read and really look into those papers, what I wanted to develop was some sort of structural design methodology which, which, which really focuses on analytical and abstract thinking. Uh, I was very keen on direct mathematical frameworks as well as understand the fundamental theory, uh, the first principles, and then uh, at the same time how 
that can be quite cross-disciplinary and how we can apply to, to perhaps uh, many different and uh, very diverse things. Um, and um, here are some tables. Uh, so graphic statics, it's a 19th century uh, design and analysis method uh, for trusses in equilibrium. Here you see some um, uh, tables by uh, Bow and Wolf. Uh, those uh, books are again around uh, 19th century. And what you see on the left, they used to have those uh, diagrammatic ways of visualizing the force and the forces. So both the form and the force are a diagram. And then the edge lengths of the force represent the axial, axial forces in the corresponding member of the truss. So back then they used to have those tables and, and the engineers and the designers of the time were able to, to see this catalog and basically decide what they want to do or have an intuitive understanding of the forces. Um, and that focused on 2D uh, examples. As you see on the right in this diagram uh, in Walt's book, um, back then graphic statics was uh, quite difficult in the sense uh, because you needed constant um, labor. So every time you had to change something, someone had to go and redraw by hand the whole diagram. And specifically for structures that are quite complicated, like the one you see here, you can imagine that that was quite a tedious task. At the same time, uh, for various reasons, it was constrained into uh, two dimensions. However, um, early uh, 20th century, these are some uh, diagrams by uh, Mitchell. Uh, there was this work on uh, optimal trusses. Uh, and here on the right, you see the famous Mitchell truss. Um, so graphic statics um, after that, uh, let's say late 19th century boom, where were extremely popular, they sort of, uh, let's say, part of declined or they were a bit forgotten. However, they, they still survived in the context of structural morphogenesis. So here we see uh, some very famous elegant uh, reinforced concrete bridges in Switzerland by Maillard. And here uh, at the bottom, you can see the um, hand drawing whereby graphic statics, he was able to inform his structural design approach. Um, another thing to mention is that uh, graphic statics can really relate to uh, this um, uh, Mason's approach into building uh, Gothic uh, cathedral. This is the King's Chapel in Cambridge, which is from the 15th century, I believe. And uh, back then you, you had these beautiful masonry structures and they were uh, perhaps a result of trial and error. Um, however, they were really characterized by this uh, merge between architects, engineers and craftsmen because all those professions over the, the last centuries have really differentiated and um, the, their specs have really changed. So, uh, things that we get uh, for granted now of whose job is to do what, what is the architect doing, what is the engineering doing, what is the craftsman doing, they were really not the same uh, a century ago, two centuries ago, or even five centuries ago. Uh, so uh, back then, um, we did have an interlink between the structural performance and the architectural form, and this could lead to a significant material efficiency as well as uh, aesthetic elegance, in my opinion. However, nowadays, um, all those professions have really differentiated. Everyone's quite specialized. It's quite difficult to talk to each other and to communicate with each other. Uh, and the structural performance uh, in, in many, many cases is not interlinked to the architectural form. So we don't have this bi-directional relationship between form and performance. Many times we uh, have uh, um, architectural form decided from the architects, and then that is given to the engineers uh, to refine this further and design a structural system that fits. Uh, that in some instances uh, can cause material inefficiency uh, because the structural performance is not taken into consideration in the early conceptual design stages. So the geometry, uh, the global geometry um, is not necessarily optimized to begin with. 
Um, and this is where my PhD uh, research uh, was uh, situated, let's say. Uh, and this, I just wanted to show you this uh, uh, paper by Maxwell from uh, 1864 on reciprocal figures and diagrams of forces. So this is the first thing uh, I saw. Uh, Bill Baker gave this to my uh, PhD supervisor, Alan McGrubby, uh, 2014, I believe, when I started. So we started really looking into this paper and what it, what it means and uh, uh, trying to understand. So some uh, key concepts that um, derive from this uh, Maxwell papers, which are extremely rich. Um, so the first one, is that uh, if we have um, a 2D truss in equilibrium, then that is a projection of a polyhedral airy stress function. So you can imagine this uh, airy stress function being a polyhedron in three space, the faces of which are flat and the kink between um, each uh, edge, which is defined by the two adjacent faces, uh, that defines the actual forces. So depending on the angle, how big or small that gets, that is readily, um, that, that's readily um, uh, also read uh, in the force uh, reciprocal. Another key concept was that uh, if we have a 2D truss in equilibrium, then there are a number of ways we can lift that up into three dimensions. So for the diagram you see here, please. Maria, sorry. Uh, before we move on, may, may I ask you to uh, to elaborate a little bit more on the, the relation between the area stress function and the, the polyhedron, the po sure. polygon, sorry. So, so what we are looking at is mm -hmm. a polygon that uh, kind of fits or satisfies the equation, right? So what we see in caption D is a 2D form diagram, let's say, right? Mm -hmm. So this can be seen as a projection of a polyhedron. The polyhedron mm -hmm. is three-dimensional. Yeah. So this polyhedron is actually a version of the airy stress function. So the airy stress function, you can imagine it as some sort of uh, smooth surface in the general case in three-dimensional space. And then if you uh, differentiate uh, in terms of the, of the curvature, you can find the corresponding stress field. So when we go now to the truss, the truss is a discrete version, right? So what it means is that the airy stress function, rather than a smooth continuous surface, is gonna become a discrete polyhedron, the faces of which are planar. And then uh, what we do is that for you define each one of the members of the truss, and you see uh, where this, can you see my mouse actually? Great. So let's take um, this edge here of the form diagram. What we can do is that we can just go up and we can see where this edge is uh, in the airy stress function. Then what we can do is that we can take the two faces that are adjacent, this one and this one. And then what we do is that we uh, just analyze the kink between those. So this angle basically, or the change in king is gonna define the axial force. So if those faces were coplanar, so the angle would be, I don't know, 180 degrees, we would have no force. However, when those start to rotate, that starts to, to give us um, the, the axial force. So it increases the magnitude and we can, we're gonna see uh, a bit more in detail in next slides, how exactly that construction is made. Um, and another key concept is um, about the states of uh, self-stress. So if we start with a diagram like the one on the left, what you see is a, it's a triangulated structure. So inside it has three nodes. Imagine now you take this uh, 2D structure and you want to lift it up to form a polyhedron. What you see is that there are three nodes that can be independently lifted up. And there are a number of ways that you can uh, design this polyhedron, let's say. And we will explain why this is important. 
Um, another thing to uh, mention is uh, projective geometry, um, because uh, this PhD research uh, uh, is really based on aspects of projective geometry. So projective geometry is a bit of a, um, um, uh, as well forgotten currently, um, branch of geometry. On the one hand, you might think that it has uh, less axioms and it's a simpler type of geometry compared to the Euclidean geometry we're very much used to. So it doesn't really have the concepts of distance, of uh, two lines being parallel, of angle or being perpendicular or metric distance. The only thing it has is the concepts of point and line and incidence. Um, so do things meet or not? Uh, the other thing is that uh, we don't really have parallel lines. So everything meets, uh, even though it might meet at, uh, at points at infinity. Uh, so projective geometry also became super popular at the end of 19th century, uh, but then also declined uh, during the 20th century. And now I think it, it also uh, undergoing a bit of a smaller in sense uh, because of uh, interest. Uh, sorry, is it yeah. is it fair to say that it's a it's a topological version of geometry because it's very much about incidence relations? No, no. So um, around the nineteenth century, it's 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 interesting to think that uh, mathematical geometrical branches as we know them today did not exist in the past. So now in our mind we have this differentiation between projective geometry and topology and set theory. In late 19th century or middle 19th uh, century, which is when those uh, branches of mathematics and geometry were being founded, it was really not clear. So back then they started to exist and topology was actually a different branch compared to projective geometry with different people working on it. However, there are overlaps, and as you say, um, they're both quite abstract. And in, in that sense, um, there are similarities, and there were also parallels uh, when those were being developed at that time. Uh, but uh, to your point, topology is also uh, something very important in the context of Maxwell's research, but uh, specifically relating to um, Euler and uh, how to count polyhedra uh, and things like that. But these are a bit uh, out of scope from what uh, we'll be seeing now. Um, the key concept of projective geometry that we've been using for this uh, particular graphic statics approach is that of duality. So what that means is that we have these mappings between geometrical elements and those uh, depend on the dimension. So in 2D, our geometrical elements are only a line and a point. So the mappings are between lines and points. When we go to 3D, we have an extra geometrical element, which is a plane. And then the duality becomes point to plane, line to line, and plane to point. And we can keep doing that, going dimensions up and up but we'll explain uh, about this a bit uh, further on. Um, so here on the left, we see a form diagram at the top and the force diagram uh, at the bottom. And we see this duality correspondence between the elements of the form diagram. So the form vertices map to force faces, the edges of the form map to edges of the force. So if you were to take uh, one, form edge and the corresponding reciprocal force edge, then only by counting the length of that uh, force edge, you can readily see uh, what is the actual force. Um, yes. Uh, I, I remember that in most uh, reciprocal diagrams, the, the form and force diagrams are kind of rotated 90 degrees against each other. Is, is that, I mean, a part? So, yeah, that, that's a good point. So in terms of, to the graphic statics, we mainly have one type of reciprocal force diagrams. However, we can, uh, let's say, place them in two ways, either perpendicular in what is called the Cremona configuration or par parallel to what is called um, the other way around, sorry, the, the Cremona configuration 
where the reciprocal edges are parallel, or the Maxwell configuration, where reciprocal edges are perpendicular. So you end up with the same reciprocal, it's just rotated. However, this difference in rotation actually reflects the way with which you have constructed those. And I will explain this a bit more. So if we see this uh, diagram here, it's a bit of a summary diagram. So we see a form diagram at the, uh, here at the top left, and we see it, its corresponding polyhedral area stress function. So when we start with this form diagram, um, what we want to do is to um, lift it up to 3D to create the uh, area stress function. And then uh, through a polarity, we can map that to its reciprocal polyhedron. So now we have a pair of reciprocal polyhedra, the projections of which are the reciprocal form and force diagrams. So we don't have only two reciprocal objects, we actually have four. Um, and that has a number of benefits. Uh, the first one is that you can see uh, each one of the 2D diagrams as the form or the force, doesn't matter. So you can start reading the force as the form and the other way around. So it, it's quite abstract and, and you can, um, you have the freedom to, to think them uh, as you wish. The other thing is that because now those um, objects are interlinked by changing each one of those four, the other three are updated automatically. So now if I start playing with the forces, the form diagram will be automatically updated and the other way around. And the other thing to mention is that uh, we talked about duality. Uh, so since form and force diagrams are projections of higher dimensional objects, their duality actually corresponds to one dimension up. So even though here we have uh, our 2D form diagram, what you see is that faces correspond to vertices and edges to edges, which is a 3D duality. And that reflects what's happening one dimension up in the space of stress functions. And you can read all about that in this paper if you're uh, more uh, inclined, but I will give a bit more context about how we can actually do these constructions. So before I talked about this polarity and duality of how we can map a point to a plane. Uh, so the way the French School of Projective Geometries used to do it, and it's a way that Maxwell was very familiar with, is this one with the paraboloid of revolution. So what they did was that given a paraboloid and the plane, you would cut the paraboloid and then take a tangent cone to that. And then the intersection of all those rays uh, would end up to a point. So that point is the reciprocal vertex. And if we do that for, uh, for instance, these simple form and force diagrams, you can see how from uh, starting uh, this simple tetrahedron with this uh, geometrical construction, we can end up with the reciprocal vertices. And then because of this duality principle, we connect the reciprocal vertices depending on whether the initial form faces are connected or not. So in the initial polyhedral area stress function, if we have two faces intersecting each other, that means that the reciprocal vertices will be connected by a line. So this is the construction. And then we can do that also for more complicated uh, examples, of course, like uh, this uh, toroidal polyhedron here. What we should mention, however, is that uh, this duality, you can do it in a number of ways. So what I just uh, showed is this purely geometrical construction. However, the same thing, you can also do it in terms of the matrix representation or also the analytical expression. So in other words, if you just have the coordinates of your plane, by using the suitable equation, you can just find the coordinates of your uh, reciprocal vertex without having to do uh, all this uh, geometrical construction. However, I just personally found it uh, very interesting. Um, another thing to uh, refer to when it comes to polarities and dualities is that uh, those uh, have not been discussed only in the context of graphic statics, but more generally in terms of transformations. So if you start with one structure by 
uh, applying this polarity, you can end up with a dual structure, which is also in equilibrium. So you can tra transform trans trusses to tensegrities um, and um, um, various other kinds of things. Um, so tensegrities uh, into grillages in the 2D case. So this concept of duality and reciprocity, it's, it, it's quite um, widespread in uh, aspects of structural design. Uh, so now, uh, based on this idea of uh, discrete area stress functions, I'm going to present more uh, ab about this uh, particular research of how to uh, design grid shells. Uh, and this is a bit what we mentioned before. Uh, so one of the key benefits of the area stress function is that it actually encapsulates in its geometry a number of very important structural parameters uh, for the form diagram. For instance, uh, the curvature between uh, faces of the area stress function define whether the corresponding um, truss member will be in tension or compression. So by sculpting the polyhedral area stress function, we can decide the load path. We can ourselves decide what is going to be the tension and compression load path. Uh, and the other thing uh, that we mentioned before was that as well, if you just decide the two phases to be coplanar, this means that uh, you have a, a zero force um, uh, edge between those. Uh, another key concept uh, that uh, derived from uh, Alan McCrobby is this of the uh, Minkowski sum. So what you can do is that if you have your form diagram and your force diagram, then you can combine those two into a new ob object, which is called a Minkowski sum. So this now has rectangles uh, and the area of which is force multiplied by length. And this is proportional to the terms of Maxwell's load path theorem. And we will see why this is uh, very, very useful. So now what we did was that we combined those insights in terms of the area stress function and how to derive uh, in a direct way uh, global equilibrium uh, with the force density method, which uh, has been also quite well known specifically for the design of uh, tensile uh, membranes and tensile structures. Um, so the key concept here is to think that uh, the force density uh, of, of a member in space is the same if that member is projected on 2D. Um, in other words, what uh, we can do here is that starting with the form diagram, we can lift that up to form uh, a polyhedral stress function. Uh, then we can reci reciprocate that to find our force diagram. Uh, and then when we have that, we can um, combine that with the force density method to lift uh, all those points up. And what we see here is that um, we, we basically see the importance of the area stress function as a design tool. So, yes. So uh, this combination with the force density method gives us a first shape that is in equilibrium, right? And then you want to start interactively editing the force diagram, yeah. right? Okay. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And so the polyhedral, uh, air stress function that, that we are looking at is actually a surf, polyhedral surface or discrete surface in a sense, mm -hmm. right? So it's a, it's a shell structure just to avoid confusion. Uh, it's, it's not the necessarily a shell Doesn't structure. have to be. Yeah, yeah. Doesn't have, but in this case, in this particular example, it is, right? So here the air stress function is a polyhedron in space. Mm -hmm. Um, and what it gives us through projection is the global 2D equilibrium. Then we take that information and we combine it with the force density method, given some vertical loading we have, and that then lifts our uh, four nodes into a 3D structure that we see here at the top left, which is our grid shell. So here our structure is the gray one. However, topologically, it is the same as the area stress function and the form diagram. All those are projections of the same thing. I see. 
And uh, what we see here is that how the air stress function is actually a design tool. So uh, here in A, we see the air stress functions. And here in B, we see the corresponding force diagrams. And here in C, we see the resulting uh, grid cell in equilibrium. So by starting to uh, amend the air stress function, what we do is that we basically design the grid cell. We decide what is the load path in terms of tension and compression. And then we also decide its shape ultimately. But what is important to say is that by definition, everything is in equilibrium because it's a projection of the air stress function. So it's a bit of a constrained structural design such that you design within equilibrium all the time. You don't have to design something and then iteratively try to push it back into equilibrium. By definition, everything is within the equilibrium space. And here are some more complicated examples of that. So here is uh, the, um, um, it's a grid shell with a um, hole in the middle basically. Uh, it looks a bit like the uh, great court roof of the British Museum. And here, again, we see the form, uh, air stress function. It's reciprocal uh, force uh, stress function that is quite intricate because here we have a more uh, complicated geometry. And here we see the load path. Uh, what we see here is that by interactively uh, changing a bit the nodes of the air stress function, we can uh, change quite significantly the shape of the resulting grid shell. This is another example. Uh, here it has a, a more um, a conventional load path in the sense that we have a tension hook uh, which constrains our roof. So the other important thing to say in this type of um, uh, structures is that uh, we, don't, we don't have any uh, further lateral uh, a reaction. So the whole thing is a self-stressed truss that it can just sit on its own without applying any forces, external forces to the corners, uh, which was uh, also something quite important for, I think, the actual uh, great court roof of the British Museum because the walls were heritage walls and they, they should not apply a lot of lateral forces to them. And this is another example where, again, we see how by interact uh, interactively uh, changing those nodes we can uh, alter the force diagram uh, as well as the resulting grid shell in static equilibrium. And here, uh, what is interesting to say is that if our air stress function is convex, that means that every edge is in compression. So compression only structures are actually a special case of this methodology. Uh, and this is what you can see here. So here at the top, we have our convex air stress function. We project down, uh, everything blue is in compression. Uh, we reciprocate to find our global equilibrium in a direct way. And then uh, by using some uh, vertical um, uh, load, we can find our grid cell in spatial equilibrium, uh, which is a compression only structure. So now let's go to uh, 3D graphic statics. What I showed before is a bit of a 2.5D in the sense that we use 2D graphic statics combined with the force density method rather than 3D graphic statics uh, in themselves. Um, so when it comes to 3D graphic statics, uh, that relates a bit to the question that Pierce did at the beginning of whether we have different types of uh, force diagrams in 2D. In 3D, we actually do have different types of um, uh, reciprocal force diagrams. So if we start here on the left and imagine that this is a spatial truss, then we have two options. Our first option is to imagine that each one of those points maps to a closed cell. Another option is to imagine that each one of those edges corresponds to a reciprocal edge. So these are two different approaches. This approach is what we say the polyhedral approach. And this is what we say, let's say the vector-based approach. And I will be focusing uh, on this approach here. Uh, this is to explain a bit more the, the vector-based one, where each one of the vertices ends up mapping to a face. And that face might, might also be a bit skewed, doubly curved in space. 
However, here we see that each one of the vertices maps to a closed cell. So in this case, we have that the axial force is represented by the area of each one of the faces rather than the length of, a, of an edge. Um, and the way to do that is again through a polarity. However, now everything goes one dimension up. So if you think that you have this 3D diagram here, what you can do is that you can take the internal node and lift it up to the fourth dimension. And the fourth dimension is spatial dimension. Then we end up with this four polytopic stress function, which we can reciprocate in 4D. And then we can project it down in 3D. And then we end up with what is called a ranking uh, reciprocal. By doing this method, even though it sounds a bit exotic, what we can achieve is that we have a direct way of global equilibrium without need of uh, iterative reconstruction of the nodes. So everything is automatically outputted. And that works for compression and tension structures. Uh, sorry, Marina. Is, is this the diagram that puts everything together? Can I ask to linger a little bit longer here? Ah, sure. So uh, can I? Uh, ask a couple of questions. So the, the concepts of polarity comes from projective geometry, right? Mm -hmm. So the, you, you, you project them uh, using that paraboloid uh, surface. And then from that polarity, you understand what should be the connections. Uh, the, yeah, exactly. So maybe mm -hmm. if we go just to the next slide, yeah. here we see this polarity duality that we saw previously in three-dimensional space. So here is exactly the same construction, just one dimension up. So now we, we sort of visualize 4D, right? Um, so now instead of a plane, we have a hyperplane. That hyperplane is where each one of the cells lives in. So the cell is now a volume. And when we inflate that one dimension up, that ends up being on a hyperplane. So you can, those constructions, they sound a bit weird, but they're exactly the same one dimension down that we're familiar with. So in three dimensions, you can imagine a polyhedron, right? If you project that polyhedron on the plane, you end up with a squeezed polyhedron, which is a 2D diagram. Similarly, if we start with uh, this three-dimensional truss here and we take its point, we can inflate it up and then those cells are gonna open up in 4D. So what we see here is actually a squeezed version of a four polytope. Four polytope being the higher dimensional generalization of a polyhedron. So this is exactly the same uh, construction we saw before, just everything is one dimension up. And as a result, we end up with a, a 4D duality, because like we said before, uh, the dimension of the form and force diagram, we need to go one dimension up to the dimension of the reciprocal stress functions to obtain their duality. So here we see how the points map to the cells and the edges map to the faces. Um, sorry, one more thing. So the, the, the concept of duality here is similar at least to the Poincaré duality, right? Sorry? The Poincaré duality, which in between um, K dimensional and N minus K dimensional elements in an N dimensional space, right? Yeah, 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 it's quite related. Uh, okay. However, here it's, it's it's not even that because back then I think also Poincaré was not alive, but it was... <laughs> maybe no. yes I don't know I don't know the exact dates yeah yeah no but you're right but uh, at, at that point uh, duality was even even simpler than in a sense than what we have now perhaps in our minds given the developments between the late nineteenth century and today yeah. Uh, but I asked this because the, there was another one which uh, I had also seen in your dissertation. And so the, one of the early diagrams that you showed uh, had written in it uh, 4D and 3D. 
right? Mm -hmm. So if we consider the, the space of embedding as a four-dimensional space or three-dimensional space, we end up with two different sorts of dualities, right? So the dualities in a four-dimensional embedding are going to be different than uh, dualities in a three-dimensional embedding. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, okay. depending on the dimension, is it di yeah. And, and the ones you are showing at the bottom part are dualities within a four-dimensional. Yeah, so everything we see okay. here uh, follows a four-dimensional duality. Uh, we just see in detail what everything maps to. So here we see how vertices map to cells and how edges map to uh, faces. And yeah, here is the, the way to do it in terms of the geometrical method. But uh, like we said, there are also other ways of doing that that are mathematically equivalent. Uh, and this is just the paper where we saw a, a case study of that. So um, perhaps here is a, is a good example to see that correspondence between uh, case studies in different dimensions. So if we start here in 2D, then we can take those uh, three vertices and lift them up into 3D. Equivalently, if we start with a 3D uh, truss, we can uh, take the internal vertices and lift them up into 4D. So it's the same type of thinking, just one dimension up, and also the geometrical elements uh, follow this uh, higher dimension. So, um, here, rather than two planes um, meeting at the line, we have two hyperplanes meeting at the at the plane. But um, it, it's essentially the same thing. You just need to, um, you know, get your hand around it. But it's it's really not uh, different. Um, and then we end up with this type of force diagrams, which look a bit like polyhedra. And these are just some types of uh, yeah, structural uh, morphology studies in terms of towers. Um, and now I would like to go to discuss a bit more about applications of this method to uh, plastic design of reinforced concrete structures. Uh, so here on the top left, we have a strat and tie model. And what is very uh, interesting and beneficial is uh, to derive a, a direct automatic way of um, deriving a discrete stress field. Uh, and then this discrete stress field gives us a number of information, including the exact geometry uh, of the nodes and the biaxial and uniaxial areas. Uh, and here, uh, the key concept is the one we mentioned before, the one of Minkowski sums. So what we do is that we start again with the form diagram, we lift it up, we get the area stress function, the curvature of which also tells us what is intention, what is the compression, what is a strut, what is a tie, where do you put uh, reinforcement. More crucially, though, when you have this approach and you have this uh, every stress function object, you can also start deciding this, these things yourself. You can say, OK, I want to put reinforcement there. I'm going to add that edge and change its curvature. Uh, the result of that is that you can do all those operations within equilibrium. And then you can derive the force diagram. And then by combining those two, you can end up with a discrete stress field. So uh, here is another example. And basically, the discrete stress field is a refined version of the Minkowski sum. So in the Minkowski sum, like we said, we have those rectangle areas that are force multiplied by length. However, we need to do some extra transformations that's not enough for it to be a valid discrete stress field in terms of allying that with the external forces, making sure everything is within the domain and making sure that also the nodal geometry corresponds to a compression only node. Uh, here are just some more uh, examples about this. Here we also see an example with the opening. And here we see uh, an example uh, in 3D. So we have this uh, concrete block. Uh, this is one of the classic examples, I believe. And this form diagram is actually a tesseract. So it's a projection of a cube within a cube. So you can also start 
seeing things like that, like projections of four polytopes that are actually 3D structures in static equilibrium. Um, and then we can, in the same way, we can find the force diagram and then we can obtain the discrete stress fields. Uh, this uh, work is also related to this work by uh, uh, Williams and McCrobby, uh, which uh, relates to and discusses uh, yield line collapse mechanism. So it's known how this is related to uh, a self-stressed truss. So if the yield line pattern is actually a projection uh, of a self-stressed truss uh, in static equilibrium, then it is compatible. And then we can also design its corresponding polyhedron, which is the area stress function. What is interesting here to say is that uh, now those uh, geometrical objects we've been discussing, the area stress function and the Minkowski sum, are actually geometric visualizations of the external work and the internal work. So now you, we also have a geometrical way of visualizing the equations, which could be quite uh, interesting, I think, also for pedagogical um, um, purposes. And here we just see a number of different uh, classic case studies. Uh, furthermore, uh, this research um, explored a bit more uh, graphic kinematics. So how the graphic statics approach can be extended to include kinematics through the uh, virtual work um, uh, theorem. So by adding the elongation of the bars, uh, you can start um, discussing and find it in a geometrical way, uh, both finite mechanisms, uh, like uh, those two cases here, and also uh, start analyzing a bit more complicated structure like this tensegrity one. Uh, so here by taking the force diagram and seeing how it is possible to move uh, the reciprocal cells with respect to each other, we can geometrically derive uh, the, the mechanisms of how this tensegrity structure uh, can move. And this is just a bit uh, of fun. Um, so this is the, the cosmic web that was a bit, uh, uh, that was a journal paper uh, published uh, four years back. Uh, and what it discusses is um, how the cosmic web is actually a, a 3D truss in static equilibrium. So the way the galaxies uh, are connected to each other through filaments um, results in this uh, foam, spatial foam, that might be the structure of, of the cosmos. And then we might be able to apply all those tools we saw to how the, um, uh, how the space is actually folding and connecting to itself. So if this is something you might be interested in, you can uh, look a bit more uh, into um, that publication. And uh, now I think that was it for the first part of uh, quite high level discussion. Uh, and uh, we can start on the second part. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, uh, maybe I can uh, just pause this and then come back to it with the questions and answers, mm -hmm. right? Sure. Okay, thank you very much. This was impressive. And just for the record, I want to say how, how impressed I am with this and how beautifully you have connected this and and just to to make sure that I'm not giving the wrong message I've, I've been nodding throughout your presentation that doesn't mean that I've understood everything uh, this is this is just the beginning it takes time and I think it's it's a, it's a very important thing to to be patient when studying or, or uh, even watching a mathematical lecture and, and taking notes etc so this is this is for my students so I don't want to pretend that I have understood everything on the percent right now. I will come back to this and revisit this and talk to you further. Thank you very much. This was great. So I will pause this and then we come back to this in the um, okay. in the Q and A. Thank you. Resume the recording. Okay. So about the the graphic statics, just just to make sure that we have a we have a proper understanding of of the purpose of the methodology. The my vague understanding, admittedly vague, is that we. Uh, I, I wrote this down because I, I thought this was a, a, a nice message to communicate that we will have the confidence of navigating the space of valid, valid solutions all the time. So if, if our aim is to create so, uh, solutions or architectures in, in equilibrium, for instance, in a compression only setting or a tension only setting or 
tensegrity, etc. Then we have the confidence that we can go from one valid solution to another. That that gives that gives uh, I hope a, an accurate picture of what this is all about, right? So we start yeah, with a valid right. solution, and with with your methodology, we can continue just exploring valid solutions. Yeah, so it's structural design um, really confined within equilibrium space. Okay, great. So I think that that's that's the the most beautiful conclusion I can make because that's that's a part of our slogan that we want to confidently navigate the the, the design spaces, and this provides an excellent example of what that could mean. You know that from one design to another, you're always confident that you are. Um, uh, that you're going from one valid solution to another. Yes, I see that uh, there's a question in the chat from, from Rick, one of our uh, graduates. Maybe I can I can just grab this opportunity to ask you something else, Marina. I think your sure. your mother tongue is Greek. So we have a we have an idea for a, for a title for our graduates, which is uh, a word similar to astronaut, uh, American astronaut and cosmonaut, the Russian version and the Taikonaut, the Chinese version. We we made the word toponaut for those who understand how to navigate topological spaces. Toponaut. Is that a good idea? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> good word. it makes sense in Greek. Okay, Greek. In Greek, it makes sense. Okay, great. <laughs> so uh so Rick van Dijk is one of our toponauts. So he he had he did a great job on topology optimization for compression only structures. So Rick, please don't be shy. Feel free to ask your question firsthand. Or maybe I can read from it. Oh, he cannot. No. Okay, he's probably at work. Okay, your PhD is very impressive, and I'm sure uh, to read it, read up on it. I might have missed it, but how can graphic statics be used for computational design, or is it more uh, an analyzing approach? Um, yeah, so I I think that's an interesting one, right? I I I mean I I, I can say something, but I would prefer to leave it to you, please. Yeah, so graphic statics is a wider framework of bidirectional design and analysis. Mm -hmm. And then that framework has a number of theories within it, right? So what I presented was one approach, one theoretical approach to graphic statics. At the same time, all those theories can be readily implemented computationally. So there are also a number of computational tools uh, which are based on different approaches that one can use. And I believe there are, there are quite a few of those. So you can think of graphic statics basically as a theoretical framework, which can be computationally implemented to be used by practitioners and students for design geometry-based visual and intuitive uh, design and analysis. And, and the word interactive also fits there, right? So you, you can go back and forth change if you understand how the load paths actually work and if you can literally see them you can configure the load paths and 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 exactly and what I, hmm, and what i find really crucial with this particular every stress function approach is that you can really design the load path you can design the decide and design the compression and tension which i think is very powerful in in conjunction with being able to uh, updating the form or the force and seeing what happens to the other. So really having this interactive reciprocal relationship between uh, all elements. I see. Beautiful. And and one more thing, which is maybe not the, maybe it's a, it's a new paradigm that you're introducing that one of the last projects that you showed was uh, for showing the discrete stress field, which mm -hmm. reminded me of the Mitchell process. Right, so you can kind of see what would be a Mitchell truss, or, or is, is that a superficial understanding? Or, or for which project? I think the project with Professor Schwartz from from ETH. Ah, right. The, the, the well, discrete discrete hmm. uh, stress field. Yeah. So for the uh, discrete stress fields, actually, uh, we take as an input the initial strat and tie model. So the initial two D form diagram is something we don't derive ourselves is something that we, we take as an input for our methodology. Um, however, there are a number of ways to derive that, derive that for example, with um, layout trust optimization or with a finite element method, which is something we're uh, currently working on. So there's going to be 
um, a new publication on that soon. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. But but the topology of of um, the the low pass is discovered or uh, that, that that's that's given. I, I don't I don't think I got that part. Yeah. So the topology um, we take it as an input. I see. Uh, so but, but then but then you figure out how how much each part will be in. in uh, yeah. Exactly. Low yeah. Depth, right. Yeah. Yeah. I see. Yeah. I see. Okay. And and is is that this the same uh, for for the other morphogenetic approaches like you you for the exploration of topologies, the it's the designer who's the who's the who's the driver who um, inserts a topology and then and uh, for the structure and then gets a gets gets a valid form essentially. Yeah. Right. So. Um how to derive that initial 2D form diagram, let's say, or that initial topology, I yeah. think it's a slightly different area of research. And there are a number of different methods that you can do that. Mm -hmm. um, the other way is that uh, you can start with an initial topology, and then depending on the structural performance, you can start to optimize it. So in a grid cell, for instance, you can think of uh, moving the trans members such that they follow principal curvatures. Um, mm -hmm. So there are, there are uh, quite a lot of um, methods and ways you can go about that, which is a bit beyond the scope of this particular graphic statics. Uh, yeah. 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 So then the, the interactive, how did you call it? Analytic, bi-directional analysis and design. Uh, mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's maybe a, a good synonym for this methodology. Okay. Great questions. Uh, more questions about this part. Oh yes, please, Yinan. Hi, um, Hi, I'm Yinan Xiao. I'm uh, actually a student of Pierluigi Di Candido. Ah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Where are you at digital question. concrete? Huh? You were at digital concrete. Yes, I was in digital concrete last uh, last week. Right. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you I remember you. Lava yeah. bro. Yeah. 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 Uh, I have a question about graphic statics, especially three-dimensional graphic statics. Um, as, as we both know that the most benefits of graphic statics when, we're, when they are studied from two-dimensional things is that it's very intuitive in, in, in the perspective of user, uh, especially for the designers that you can very easily to see the reciprocal relationship, relationships between the form and force diagram. However, uh, when we go to 3D or even higher dimension, we, the force diagram, especially in the poly, uh, polyhedron based force diagram is not very intuitive anymore for the designers. My question is that, uh, what do you think that uh, is any potentials that in three dimensional graphic statics that is, uh, could be more, um, intuitive to work and play with it for the for the designer for the users this is my first question yeah okay so like we said in terms of 3d graphic statics there are basically two types of different force reciprocals the vector based like the one here yeah. yeah. has been developing where yeah. you can visualize the forces in terms of edges and yeah. then the other polyhedral approach that we have been also working on uh, my answer to that is that uh, the most suitable reciprocal type depends on what you want to do. So if you want, for instance, to um, do some form finding uh, of something like a pedestrian bridge, uh, then I would say that the vector-based approach um, is quite beneficial because it's easier to change things and visualize what is happening. However, uh, in other applications, such as the ones with uh, discrete stress fields, uh, the suitable approach is the one of the ranking uh, reciprocals because uh, you can't really do it in any other way. So mm -hmm. you can't derive stress fields in 3D with vector-based approach, or, or maybe mm -hmm. there are ways around it, but uh, we think it's um, more suitable to use directly those reciprocal force cells. So in other words, the, the best approach depends on what you want to do. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And that sounds very reasonable because sometimes you 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 know that uh, vector-based uh, graphic statics, the force diagram or form diagram sometimes is not really 
reciprocal in terms of mathematics because you need to first make it planar and then goes back and then some some force layers is duplicated and so on. So yeah, maybe due to different projects, you need to choose different methods to make it. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for the answer. Yeah. Sure. Thanks for your question, you know, if, if I may uh, hijack the question also a bit, I think one of the most intriguing aspects of your work, Marina, for me was the, the, the three ways that result in the same thing. So if one, one approach, which is the geometrical construction, ends up being uh, overly complicated, we can, we can follow the, the matrix or, or the analytic approach, which you didn't talk about today, right? Yeah, so those are equivalent mathematical approaches. I have focused specifically on the geometrical one, but you can also just use the other ones. Um, the, perhaps the benefit of the other ones can be seen in terms of computational implementation. Mm -hmm. So if you want to... More straightforward my, implementation. Yeah, exactly. So also myself, when I was writing the code for my PhD thesis, for the, especially for the 4D stuff, I think I just used matrices. Right. Yeah. That 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 was uh, that was my true question, uh, which is uh, I I can formulate it like this. So if if I were to, you know, read read. Uh, so let me ask it like this. So if what would be your suggested way of reading your work, your your PhD dissertation from cover to cover, or would you start from a another chapter in the middle, or? Uh, like what's, well, what is the easiest part to start with? That's, that's I guess, my question. Well, I would think from the start, because it starts giving a bit of historical context and, uh, okay. you know, understand a bit uh, where the research is positioned. But then I think perhaps um, a good way is to go through the journal papers, because each one of those, it's an entity. Uh -huh. in um, okay. So, yeah, I would think that the three... Uh, journal papers I showed in, along with the, the three corresponding the, to those three methods, right? Sorry? The, the, the three corresponding to the three methods that you showed there are around the cycle. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, basically the, the journal papers, uh, as well as uh, quite a few papers uh, from 2015 onwards. Uh, of uh, Bill Baker at SOM and Alan McGrobby at the uh, University of Cambridge, I think they can give the whole picture into this uh, particular approach, which uh, the air stress function is really the, the center of. Okay, great. So I think uh, I, to, to stick to the promise that I gave at the beginning, uh, I thought that 90 minutes is a good time frame because I know that people, quite a few people watch football matches that last 90 minutes. So I think we can also have a 90 minutes discussion about something so interesting and scientific, which is also informative. But uh, to, to, to keep that promise, then, then we'll, we'll stop the recording at 90 minutes and that may give you, I don't know, depending on your schedule, a few minutes to, to also talk about the questions, eventual questions about the other part. And that's it. If there are no more questions about the graphic studies, then I think we can close this part. Thank you very much for your active participation. Thank you once again, Marina, for the beautiful presentation. And hope to see you again soon.